The upper layers of protocol in the internet are where application programs communicate. The majority of applications communicate using the data transfer service provided by the TCP protocol that we looked at in earlier videos. TCP is what we call a transport protocol. It provides a reliable stream between source and destination. And the applications use that data stream to communicate between client program and server program using another layer of protocol. This is what we call the application layer protocol. To describe application layer protocols, I'm going to cover two very commonly uh, used protocols. That is the HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is used to fetch web pages, and SMTP, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, that's used to send email. These protocols are conceptually very simple and are based on simple lines of text that are sent between the client and the relevant server. The server responds with lines of text as well. Now, I've talked about the Transmission Control Protocol, uh, usually called TCP slash IP, in earlier videos. And we know that the address of the source and the destination in a TCP connection is a 32-bit number, usually written as four decimal numbers. For example, 129.78.8.1. But TCP connections also have an extra level of addressing we call the port. The 32-bit IP address identifies the interface on the computer and the 16-bit port number identifies an application running within the computer. And that application is listening for connections to that particular port. Port numbers are 16 bits, so that means there are 64K possible port numbers. Many of these are reserved for particular protocols, but a large number are available for general use. Like most of the names and addresses on the internet, port numbers are managed by the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, or IANA. And you can see a complete list of the reserved port numbers on the IANA website, www.iana.org. In particular, the web protocol HTTP has port 80 reserved, and the email protocol SMTP has port 25 reserved. The Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, is the sequence of messages used to request web pages and send information to a web server. It's a very simple text protocol, just lines of text, which are interpreted by the client and the server. For simple operations, such as fetching a web page, it's very easy to generate those lines of text uh, which contain the HTTP messages. So the process starts <clears throat> with a web browser making a TCP connection to port 80 on the destination machine. And this will connect the browser to the web pro um, server process. The browser then sends uh, an HTTP GET message. This is a particular line of text with the word GET at the beginning uh, and some other parameters, which I'll show you in a moment. This line of text specifies the web page to be retrieved and the web server program then retrieves the HTML page from a file system or from a database, or it might generate uh, the page completely itself. It then returns the page as part of an HTTP reply message. Here is a minimal example sequence of HTTP protocol lines. You can see that the index.html page or file was requested in the GET request. Also, the version of the HTTP protocol uh, in use is specified in that guest request. The return message has two parts, separated by a blank line, the header and the body. And the body is the page that's being returned. The header has a number of lines. The first is the version of the HTTP protocol in use, uh, and also a code describing the result of the transaction. 200 means everything was okay. Other codes include 404 not found, and there are many other conditions that uh, you might see sometimes on your browser when a page uh, is failed to be uh, uh, retrieved. The standard for HTTP is defined in a request for comments, RFC 7231, and that's available at the RFC um, editor website uh, shown here on the screen. HTTP is a simple protocol, and there are many function libraries in most languages that implement it. 
For my second example of an application program, I'll describe the protocol used to transfer email. It's called the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, or SMTP. And like HTTP, it's also text line based with a fairly small set of commands. Now the first step is we need to find out the address of the mail server to use. Because very often, even though your um, uh, email address might be uh, something like gmail.com, uh, that's not actually the mail server. The mail server uh, is a, a separate machine, often for a big system like Gmail, it's many different machines, and we need to find out the IP address of the mail server to use. And the way we do this is that we consult the domain name service. Now, the domain name service I introduced in an earlier video. For each domain that has a server that accepts email, there's a record in the DNS called the MX or Mail Exchanger record. And this record contains the address of the mail server for that domain. So you can see here the client, the first thing it does is it uh, does the DNS request for the relevant MX record. And that will return a, uh, um, a server IP address or often just a server uh, host name, which is then translated to an IP address. The client then makes a connection to that mail server and the server will send an initial status message. The client replies, the uh, mail server responds, and so on, with the mail item included in the exchange. So, for example, here is the, uh, the uh, set of lines for SMTP uh, that are a simple exchange of protocol. The format of the email message is yet another standard. It consists of a header and a body section, much like the HTTP response message I showed earlier. Uh, the header has a series of lines with some, uh, some keyword colon at the beginning uh, and uh, it's followed by a blank line and then the body is any text. Now the standard for email messages, as I said there's yet another standard, is called MIME which stands for the Multipurpose Internet Mail Extensions. And in fact it was an extension of the original internet email format which contained text only. MIME is very flexible and can carry any sort of information. This is how email attachments are carried and how binary files such as images can be embedded in email. And once again, MIME is documented in a series of Internet Requests for Comments or RFCs uh, starting with RFC 2045. Here's an example of a, a MIME formatted message. Now, you can see that in this example, the email contains a number of parts. Each part has a content type line that specifies the type of the content in that part. For example, uh, text slash plain or uh, image slash uh, JPEG. Uh, or it might specify that the part itself is made up of multiple subparts. So for example, multi-part slash related. The content type line also specifies a termination string that's used to terminate the part. Other lines give more information about the parts of the message. A very important one is the content transfer encoding line that specifies how binary information is encoded into the limited text character code. In this case, it uses the base64 encoding, which encodes each group of six bits, that's 0 to 63, in the message with a single ASCII character. Now, when an email message is transferred, there are many protocols at MIS level. At each intermediate link, there'll be a data link protocol, like Ethernet. Then there's the end-to-end -end internet packet layer. Then there's the transport protocol, TCP IP. Then there's the application layer protocol, SMTP. And along the way, we use the DNS protocol to resolve the address of the mail server. Then there's the MIME standard for the format of the mail message. Wow, there's a lot of standards there. And that's not to mention standards like the character code, standards for images, and so on. So to summarize, machines have IP addresses and applications or server programs can be contacted using another level of addressing called the port. The TCP layer carries application protocol messages from client to server. Many protocols such as HTTP and SMTP consist of messages that are plain ASCII lines of text and are very easy to implement. The many standards involved are documented in request for comments or RFCs, and if you want detailed information about the protocols, that's the place to look. 
So, thanks for watching.